Welcome. Welcome to today's uh, Duxbury's COVID-19 uh, update, but this one is a unusual economic forum that was organized by Josh Cutler. Um, it's 1.30 1 today on the 10th of, of April, and we're going to have um, a number of people joining us on this economic forum. You can watch this on uh, in Duxbury on Comcast 15 or Verizon 39. It will also be live on PAC TV streaming website. Go to pactv.org slash live, or you can watch it on PAC TV's Facebook page. Uh, we are going to be joined today by a number of distinguished guests. Uh, we have uh, Representative uh, Josh Cutler of the 6th Plymouth District, Representative Kathleen Lenatra of the 12th Plymouth District, Senator Patrick O'Connor from the Plymouth and Norfolk District, Ted Flynn, who is a Duxbury Selectman, and Ann Antonellis, who is from the Duxbury Business Association. Not everybody has quite joined us yet, so we're going to start today um, with everyone will have about five minutes to talk about the, their particular economic topic, and we're going to start with Ann Antonellis. Can you uh, introduce yourself, Ann, tell us a little about your background, and then what you're going to talk about today. Okay. Um, I'm Ann Antonellis. I'm the president of the Duxbury Business Association. Plus, I also am owner president of Duxbury Mortgage. So, I'm kind of in a little bit interesting um, perspective since I'm right in the mortgage industry and banking, and it's been kind of fascinating what's been happening the last month or so. Um, first, um, let me talk a little bit about uh, the mortgage industry. We are definitely in a very difficult time. Um, with everything that's happened with the virus, it has uh, definitely affected what's going on in the market. We have um, a lot of good things that the government has brought out, which I'm going to talk about that first. Um, if somebody is in trouble um, but through the CARE Act, we have um, forbearance for mortgages that um, is definitely helping people who want to delay their payment. And that's the big key word is that a lot of people think that the when they call up their servicer to find out about forbearance, they are thinking that they are going to not have to pay it back. It's not a forgivable program. It is something that can delay up to six months. It can be added on to your mortgage balance at the end. It can be amortized. And it can also um, that you can um, pay it over a certain period of time. You have to negotiate and speak to your, your servicer. Your servicer is not necessarily your lender. So that's a really key thing. Um, and the other thing about a forbearance, while they say that it will not affect your credit, it will not affect your credit for the first six months from what the government's saying. However, if you get into a bind and it continues on, it could affect your credit. Um, I'm not saying it will, but I'm saying we don't know what's going to happen in the future. The other item that is right now, we will not allow, we are not allowed to write a mortgage that is in forbearance. So if you want to refinance or you decide to sell your house and purchase another house, if you have forbearance, that's an issue. So, you know, there's so much more to it. Forbearance to people who need it. It's not for everybody to say, I get, you know, a, a freebie on my mortgage for a few months so I can go do other things. Not that we can ever do anything anymore, but that's another issue. Um, so that's one issue that, you know, in the mortgage world and banking world we're dealing with. Um, the other thing is, is that a lot of people, um, and I'm going to just go into rent for a minute, um, people who rent, they're like, oh, I'm not going to pay my rental payment because there's some issues that the government has said we've been able to, you know, not pay that. Which again, if you definitely need it, that's, that's why it's there. But just to get a rent holiday, you know, you have to be very careful too, because the landlord has a mortgage and the government works out for consumers and a consumer is not a landlord. Um, so they have to pay their mortgage. When they, if they don't pay their mortgage for anything, the servicer then still has to pay the investor. So it's very complicated. You can read up on it or call me and I can talk to you about it because it's a lot more details than just for this few minutes. But um, there's a lot of things impacted. Um, as the mortgage market of what we're doing right now, there, there has been definitely a refinance boom. The rates um, have been down and up and all around. Um, they uh, have had a real issue that um, because of the mortgage-backed securities and the government putting money in and buying them, um, some lenders are really feeling the crunch. At first, we had a crunch on the situation being that there was so much volume that it was scary. Now it's that lenders are scared because they can't find investors for the loans. 
Um, unless you're going to a large bank situation, most jumbo loans are gone right now because um, there's not investors for it. High balance, which is anything over 510 in the Plymouth County area, is difficult unless you're doing a rate and term refinance, and even that's difficult. So we're down at conventional loans. Um, as for mortgage rates, some lenders, um, not Fannie Mae or Freddie Mac, but or FHA, but some lenders are putting their own um, numbers on, uh, what do we call uh, conditions on that they will not lend unless it's a 660 FICO score. Um, FHA is still saying you know, what their rules were, but these lenders are the basic people who are lending the money, not FHA. FHA is guaranteeing the money. So there's a difference and people don't always understand it. So these lenders are scared. They wanna make sure they get paid back because you know, it's on their books. So they're making sure that we're going to hopefully not have as much of a financial crisis in the end that we had in 2008, 2009. Uh, we're definitely gonna have a while to bail out of this. Um, so that's the mortgage thing. The real estate, I mean, it's on hold. I know Kathy's a realtor too, and so she could talk a little bit about that. But um, I know that we're doing virtual um, housing. Offers are coming in still. It's amazing. People are doing virtual uh, reviews of the homes. I think that sometimes they'll go into them. I'm, I'm not on top of all that. I just know um, the realtors are pretty scared. I know that they're applying for unemployment too, because you know even if they go, you know, their lead time of a few months of what they're selling now closes two months from now. So, you know, is the money coming in for them to pay their bills too? Because they're full-time people. They're out there trying to um, do the best for people. Um, as the DBA president, let me talk a little, just a quick minute. I talked to the Rotary Club um, this morning and um, they do have a um, website that you can go on into the, uh, it's called the Good Neighborhood um, Fund and you can go on if you are somebody in Duxbury working or living in Duxbury and you have a need, they are providing um, help. Call, you can go on and they will let you know they're doing basically gift certificates to grocery stores to help you for food. So hopefully, if they can give you money for food, then you can take the other money and pay the bills that you have to pay. Um, a lot of people, you know, get nervous about applying for things like this because you know. Um, they, are, they don't want everybody to know that they're having troubles. A lot of people are having troubles that hadn't had them before. The other thing is the Interfaith Council has always been a great resource for Duxbury um, and they too will help you. Um, they have the oil fund, heating fund, electric fund, whatever. Um, so the Interfaith Council in Duxbury is a wonderful resource. Um, Josh has been doing a wonderful job um, letting us know what's out there for businesses, I believe. Um, we also have, um, which I know he's going to get into. The DBA, I've been trying to let people know what's still open. Um, there are still restaurants doing takeout. I know some stores have been doing Easter things, you know, curbside, you call them, they'll drop off an Easter package for you. You know, everybody's trying to be as normal as possible. Um, Brothers, is, I guess, has been doing, and I mentioned Brothers because that's our only grocery store in town, really, except for our convenience stores. They do a wonderful time, uh, what I've heard from making sure that the store is clean, making sure that everything's wiped down. So um, as a town and a lot of people in the town have been raising funds doing, um, the senior center is still doing um, Wheels on Meals for 200 meals, I believe a day that they're doing. Um, so the people in there are just being wonderful for senior citizens. So um, that's a little bit my handle on what's going on in the world at my dining room table. <laughs> hey, thank you, thank you so much. Um, the, next up we're gonna have Representative Kathleen Lenatra. And Kathy, you're gonna talk about real estate and also some other Families first um, issues uh, if yeah. for, for funding. Go ahead. Hi, and thank you. That was very helpful from the mortgage perspective. Um, real estate is, as you say, it is still um, up and going. It has slowed down quite a bit. Uh, they are, a lot of people are actually buying sight unseen because they have, buyers have been having a hard time. It's been a seller's market for a while now. And a lot of buyers have been blocked out of homes, putting on multiple offers on homes and being blocked out. So um, they are looking at homes virtually and they are still allowed to go into a home. Uh, open houses, have, although are, you know, they have stopped. We don't want 10 people in a home altogether. So you know, it's still going. We still can do the fire inspections. We can still do it, an appraisal. I heard through the grapevine in my office that appraisals may just be drive-by appraisals and inspe home inspectors are still inspecting homes so 
it's it's going it's going very slowly but it is it definitely a hardship on the realtors and the brokers that are out there it has come to almost a halt slow but um this is as you said this is their full-time job um and it's you know this is the market this is spring market which has put a damper on most people um so that's where that is. But I did want to talk about the Families First Coronavirus Response Act. So to be eligible for this, you need to have subject to a federal, state, or local quarantine or isolation order related to COVID-19. You've been advised by a healthcare provider or self-quarantine related to COVID-19. You are experiencing COVID-19 symptoms and are seeking medical diagnosis. You're caring for an individual subject to an order described or self-quarantine as they are as described. Or if you're caring for a child whose school or place of care is closed because of COVID-19. So that's really interesting because I do get a lot of questions um, asking for a stipend or for something because now they need to still work and our children aren't in school and they did not budget for childcare. So that's an option for working folks. Um, and if you've experienced any other substantial similar conditions specified by the Secretary of Health and Human Services. So I did have a constituent too that is severely compromised, but his job is considered essential and he may fit into this right here so he could stay home and still collect. Um, the, I just wanted to touch on too, if we, I could, the Department of Transitional Assistance. So the, all their local offices are closed, but you can go on their website. And if you have lost your job, you are entitled to some extra services. So that is something else to look into if you are related to the Department of um, Transitional Assistance, the DTA. Okay. Thanks, Julie. Thank you so much, Kathleen. Um, the next up is going to be um, Josh Cutler, who um, actually put this whole thing together. And Josh, you're going to be talking about uh, a number of different um, economic avenues that are out there and there's so many questions on it. So take it away, Josh. Great, thanks, Julie. Thanks to everyone for joining us. Uh, it's good to see Selectman Flynn. It looks like he hasn't met a razor lately. So uh, <laughs> otherwise looking good though. Good to see my colleagues. Thanks for everyone for joining us. Um, so I'm just gonna quickly kind of, probably too quickly go over a couple of things and then save some time after my colleagues go to take questions. Cause I think that's really where the, the focus should be. Um, as you can see, uh, Dexter Beach may be closed, but uh, virtually it's still open. And here's a nice view of Granite Light that I took. So hope you enjoy that. <laughs> That's my office space. Um, I want to talk about two things. Uh, one is unemployment. And the second is the Paycheck Protection Program. And I'll go through them kind of quick uh, right now and then happy to come back a little bit more in depth. Uh, unemployment. So obviously, many folks, unfortunately, sadly, are facing uh, unemployment. Uh, we've seen the number of claims skyrocketing. We've, we've been adding, ramping up staff very quickly. Division of Unemployment. Um, so two things you need to know. Number one, if you're a traditional, when I say uh, traditional, you were uh, working at a job that, uh, you know, getting a W-2, a traditional employee, then you're eligible for unemployment. Um, and uh, that process is ongoing. There are folks who are having some, having some trouble connecting with the department. And they are, you know, as you can imagine, getting a massive number of inquiries. And so they're asking everyone to fill out the, the online form. If you do continue to have problems, I would encourage you to reach out to one of our offices, wherever you happen to live. Um, and we can try to assist you, but just also try to be patient because they're getting a ton of, uh, of inquiries, as you can imagine. Uh, but we are hearing through our office that people are getting, uh, it's taking a little bit of time and people are getting their benefits approved and getting the process moved ahead. So that's very good. Um, so just uh, actually this week, we got federal, uh, the CARES Act provided some new federal benefits for unemployment, one of which is a $600 per week per claimant, which is now being added to uh, claim. So that's a nice benefit for folks. That will happen automatically, and it is uh, it is retroactive uh, um, to March 29th. And that will run through July 31st, so an extra $600 a week per claim. Now, a lot of folks asking about unemployment benefits for the self-employed or uh, ten, so you know gig economy workers, 1099s. Traditionally, in Massachusetts, those kind of folks are not eligible because they're not paying into the system as a traditional employee. But again, thankfully, because um, of the, the CARES Act passed by Congress we are able to the fir for the first time to extend unemployment benefits to those folks because we know they're hurting and they need the help. Um, and so uh, that those same benefits that I just mentioned, the extra $600 a week, the extended uh, time period will apply to folks who are self-employed, sole proprietors, 
1099 and, and gig economy workers. Now, there's a little bit of a, 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 a catch, and that's that because this is a new thing that the federal government has just passed and the state has just gotten the information about this, there's going to be a little bit of a delay, frankly, too much of a delay, I, I think, but, you know, we all need to be patient here uh, before that portal is open. And so we're being told right now that's going to be April 30th. We're all hopeful that will happen sooner. And, um, you know, I had a conversation actually with the Executive Office of Workforce and Labor Development today to express my views on that, and I, I'm sure others have, and we appreciate all that they're doing, but we want to see that that gets done as quickly as possible. So those are two things that are very important to know for unemployment. And I'm happy to come back and answer some questions about that. Wanted to mention also a great program, the Paycheck Protection Program, which is a great option for uh, small businesses and also those folks who are self-employed or sole proprietorships. Uh, basically, it's, it's called a loan program, but it really is a grant program because most of the loan can be forgiven. Um, you can borrow up to $2 million, and it's based on the maximum, um, it's based on your payroll costs for your business. Uh, so, and it, it uses a formula of 2.5 times your average monthly payroll costs. And when they say payroll costs, they're including costs for health insurance premiums, state and local taxes, uh, paid family leave, and other associated costs. So, you, you figure out what your average monthly payroll cost is, including those figures, multiply that by 2.5, and then it's how much you're allowed to borrow under the Paycheck Protection Program or PPP, not to be confused with PPE. Um, and so the great thing about this loan is that it is it has a forgiveness uh, provision. And so if you use the proceeds to keep your employees on your payroll and can document that, you can get the full amount of the loan forgiven. So in essence, it turns into a grant. There's a formula that involves, um, it, it, basically the way it works is that 100%, um, it takes a look at what you spent on employee payroll and then it adds 25% uh, you can include costs for um, mortgage or rent or utilities, and then that amount can be deducted from the amount that you borrowed. So as long, and it's over an eight week period. So as long as you're keeping your payroll intact and continuing to pay folks the wages, you can get that money forgiven so that essentially Uncle Sam is paying for you to pay those wages, which is the idea here. We wanna keep people employed, we wanna keep people working, um, and, and it's in everyone's interest to do so. So the Paycheck Protection Program, it's a, it's a great thing. You'll never get a, a loan like this again. Uh, there's no personal guarantee. There's no collateral. There's no origination fees. Um, it's really, truly a, a grant that the government is, is offering to try to keep people employed in this unusual time. So I would really strongly recommend anybody uh, who's got a small business, and that it's, it, the definition is 500 employees or less. So that applies to almost every business here on the South Shore. Um, and it has pretty broad um, parameters. And again, it includes nonprofits and it does include those folks who are self-employed or, self or independent contractors as well. So happy to take questions at the end about that, but that is something that's really fantastic and I would encourage you to, to reach out. And again, you wanna reach out to your local bank. This is something that's being handled by local banks. They are getting a lot of inquiries, a lot of requests for this, as you can imagine. So it pays to go to a bank where you already have an established relationship. Some banks are only accepting applicants who have an established banking relationship. Others are a little more flexible, uh, but it really is something that you should uh, right away get on. There's, uh, I think, $350 billion that Congress funded this. That will go quick. Uh, that will go quick. And uh, we don't know if they'll be reauthorizing that. So uh, the Paycheck Protection Program, PPP, please take a look at that, and we'll come back and talk a little bit more during the Q&A portion. So thanks for tuning in. Thank you so much, Josh. And next we're going to go to Senator Patrick O'Connor, and he's going to be talking about economic impact direct cash payments and a couple of the other loans. Welcome, Senator. Thank you. Thanks for uh, having us. Uh, these have been very helpful. Uh, I wanted to thank and uh, recognize Representative Cutler for uh, inviting us and putting this on. I think this is going to be really beneficial to the folks in Duxbury. And hi, Kathy. Hi, Ted. Thank you uh, for both joining us and Anne as well. Um, one, of the, um, one of the core components of the CARES Act that Josh uh, had highlighted uh, with PPP, in addition to that, that was the one-time cash payments that the federal government's going to make to a vast majority of Americans. And uh, one of the one of the criteria for individuals, so it's a $1,200 cash payment for anyone who's making uh, under $75,000 a year. From seventy-five dollars to $99,000 a year, it, uh, it slowly deducts from the $1,200 and then anyone making over $99,000 a year is ineligible to receive this benefit. With couples, 
it's uh, it goes one hundred and fifty thousand dollars. You get the full benefit of the one thousand two hundred dollars per individual, so twenty four hundred, and um, it again decreases from one hundred and fifty thousand um, up until the threshold of one hundred ninety eight thousand. Anyone making more than one hundred ninety nine thousand as a couple a year is ineligible for this. I know that's kind of confusing, and a lot of numbers being thrown out there all at once. But essentially speaking, a family of four making less than one hundred and fifty thousand a year can expect to see. $3,400 as there's also a kicker with this of $500 per child that you have. This has been something that we know uh, is not going to be a complete fix. We know that there's still going to be financial hardships that individuals and families will face, but this is definitely something that will uh, help in, uh, in you know, smoothing some of the challenges that families are facing right now. Another uh, interesting uh, loan opportunity that's available for small businesses has actually been something that's been around for quite some time called the Economic Injury Disaster Loan Program. This is a program that is established essentially for areas where there's emergencies. If there's a hurricane or a tornado, this loan opportunity opens up to individuals. And since there's been a federal declaration of emergency, this is now opened up to everyone. And so what this loan does is it's very similar to the PPP, except for the fact that there is uh, not a debt forgiveness component to the economic disaster, economic injury disaster loan program. This is eligible for uh, small businesses and nonprofits. Definitely want to highlight the and nonprofit component of this of under 500 people. You can submit an application and get up to $10,000 almost immediately within the next, within a two or three day period from applying for this. Whereas PPP right now, I know that um, with the inundation of folks that are applying for that, that'll take a little bit longer. So if you are in immediate need for cash, this and for your business or nonprofit, this is one of the avenues that I would recommend going down. The maximum loan amount for this is uh, $2 million, and it's designated basically for six months of operational expenditures. The loan rates on this would be for a small business, 3.75%, and for nonprofits, 2.75%. And again, unlike PPP, where um, there is no uh, collateral, there is some collateral, but that's over a certain amount of money that would need to be put on this. But if you're looking, if you're a small business right now that is in dire straits, that may be an essential business that, um, that your, your secondary component of revenue has come down, you need some more additional assistance, this is something that could be a bridge to bring you from where you are right now to the PPP once you're able to get that. And I must note, too, there is a way that you can go and apply for the Economic Injury Disaster Loan Program and actually fold that into your PPP. So there is a way that you could um, apply for this loan and have it be forgiven if you are also accepted for a PPP in the future. So, you know, kudos to the federal government for putting uh, this available, uh, this out there available to every small business and nonprofit now under 500 employees. And then kudos for the uh, PPP, as Josh had said. Uh, huge demand for all of this and uh, highly recommend speaking to your um, your banking partner as soon as possible if you're uh, if you're looking to apply for either one of these um, either one of these programs great thank you really 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 good information um, before we go to the overview and taking all kinds of questions for a, a really specific Duxbury point of view we're going to go to selectman Flynn um, Ted what what does this have to do with the uh, the actual effects of the residents in Duxbury? Well, I, I want to let you know that town government is working. And let me give you something that's very important, which is the website, town.duxbury.mass.us. Most things that you would do in person, you can do online uh, going through the website. I'd just like to run down some of the services. For example, schools are physically closed but they're virtually open. We have virtual concerts going on. We have the principal of Alden School who doing readings for the young folks. We have laptops provided to most of the children. The senior center, the senior center is closed, but as Ann mentioned, Mondays and Thursdays, you can have home delivered meals. And if you have transportation issues, call the senior center, they might be able to help you. Library is closed physically, but you can order ebooks. The student union is closed, but I saw yesterday where they had a chef on who was giving uh, recipes out. Recreation, the beach is closed, the trails are open. So 
the physical playgrounds might be closed, the pool is closed, but all of our nature trails are open. And as long as you keep safe distance and presumably uh, wear a mask, that they're available to you for recreation. You can do your bills online. You can reach the assessor online. You can reach the clerk online. You can get all of your permits, like construction, clamming, et cetera, online. Fire police, public uh, service are all 24-7 uh, operational, as is the DPW. And um, you can even, committees of the, the uh, town can hold meetings uh, virtually. They can have Zoom meetings. And there's the, the how to do it is on the website. We have not had any um, provision for limiting um, tax payments. Taxes are due, uh, but they again can be done online. Just a quickie on, on COVID-19. We have had 20 COVID-19 cases in town. Of the 20, 10 are fully recovered, and hopefully the other 10 will be fully recovered soon. Um, Town meeting. Town meeting has been continued until June 13, and we're optimistic that it will be, um, we will be able to host town meeting. It might be in a very different format. We've even spoken about maybe it being held outside um, over near uh, the field. Um, I'm glad to an uh, answer any questions. I would like to give a shout out to Senator O'Connor, Representative Lenatra, and Representative Cutler for the fine job they're doing in rep representing and protecting Duxbury and the townspeople here. The one thing that Representative Cutler should have noted was that I had to buy some gray for my beard to make myself look more mature. <laughs> Other than thanks. Town specific thanks. update. I'd like to bring up something that we're going to bring up onto our screen, and I'm really sorry that it's going to show up as being a little bit smaller, but this is on Josh's website, and if you can look at this, it's a quick guide to the state and federal assistance programs. It says, if you are, down this column, is self-employed or a gig economy or small business, and then over here, it's all the different things that people are talking about, the different types of loans, the different types of, of uh, economic... Uh, things that are available to people. And it really gives a, uh, and you can come back to me because you can't even see this. Um, it gives a really good snapshot of, I'm so confused. What do I, what do I qualify for? Because some people really, really don't, they really don't know. Josh, can you, can you speak to this a little bit and how you're putting it together? Right. And if you have to update it mm -hmm. at all? This is something that Senator O'Connor, Representative Lenatra, and I and others have, uh, worked on collaboratively and put together, and it's available on my website, and I'm sure they have it available as well. Just a chart, so you know, if you're, you know, depending on what you are, what particular bucket you fall into, if you're self-employed or self-proprietor, maybe run a small business, or um, maybe you're unfortunately been laid off or had to leave work for family or health reasons, and then you know, what kind of benefits are you eligible for? Because um, it can be very confusing. There's a lot of different things happening at the state level, at the federal level. Even heard local benefits uh, at the community level. And so just kind of knowing what's available and what's out there is important. So it's kind of a, just a little, very simple chart that has, you know, green and red, depending on what you're eligible for. And you can, it can learn more information and kind of check out in more details what, um, what the next steps are. But uh, we've taught, you know, great speakers have talked on some of these things, the, the, the direct cash payments that Senator O'Connor was talking about, the unemployment, both the traditional unemployment and the, what we call pandemic unemployment, which is at the federal government Path that I that I was talking about the PPP loan, uh, the economic injury industry, industry injury disaster loan. Excuse me, I can't say that. Senator O'Connor mentioned uh, Families First Corona Response Act that the Rep. Lenato was talking about. Uh, we didn't talk too much about this, but also there's was Massachusetts Transitional Assistance um, (SNAP), which provides food benefits, TAFDC, SSP, other programs that we already have that help folks who are low income um, to uh, to get through uh, transitional times. So that's something that folks should be aware of as well. And the last thing just wanted to mention was um, Matt, the Health Connector. Healthcare obviously is a concern for everyone. The Mass Health Connector has um, is a great way to plug in your information and see what you might qualify for in terms of a low cost, or in some cases, no cost through Mass Health uh, Healthcare Plan. So mahealthconnector.org is a great resource. So 
Uh, that, that chart is on our websites and we'll share that around after this forum. Sorry, I couldn't make it bigger for you to see. I certainly couldn't see with my old eyes <laughs> and uh, my gray hair, although I, I don't have as much as Ted, but um, anyway. <laughs> <laughs> we'll throw it back to you, Julie, and hopefully we have some good questions. Okay, we do. First and foremost, I think we all need to understand that people will come at this whole situation from two very different views. You're an employee or you're an employer, and sometimes you're both. So I know I have noticed that there are a lot of people that, that ask questions all the time for all the forms that we do is, I don't know what my employer's doing. I don't know if they're applying for this loan or that disaster. So I don't know, should I apply for my unemployment? Uh, can someone speak to that? Who raise your hand? Who wants to who wants to speak to that one? Um, in terms of who should best what 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 should first of all what should an employer do for their employees? Um, and secondly, what is left up to the employee and what is left up to the employer? Who wants to take that one? Julie, let me let me just clarify part of that, and then anybody else can feel free to jump in. So, because I've had this question as well, when it comes to the Paycheck Protection Program, because um, that is one of the the major things. So that you know that's for employers or the self-employed or sole proprietors. If you're an employee and you're, you know, been laid off, then you should by all means apply for unemployment. Or if you're unable to work for health reasons or for taking care of your family reasons and they meet the criteria, you should apply for unemployment as well. Um, your employer has decisions to make uh, for their own part to keep their business running and to hopefully continue to pay their employees. And part of that calculation for the loan forgiveness that I talked about has to do with your payroll. And uh, there is a provision so that if, an, if, if, if a small business had, had previously laid off some employees or perhaps had to do that still, as long as they bring them back by a certain period of time, and that's 30 days after the, the CARES Act was passed, um, they can still be eligible to have those employee costs forgiven. So for an employer, it's, it's, a, it's a sort of a balancing act to decide and look at, you know, you got to look at the numbers and see, you know, am I going to be better off? Um, trying to keep everybody on the payroll and then get the loan forgiven, or am I going to have to make some tougher decisions? Now, obviously, we hope that everyone will stay on the payroll, will keep people employed, keep people, um, you know, going, and that and that is, you know, that is the preferred option. But for some businesses, it may be a tough a trade off. They have to make that decision um, for what's what's going to keep their business afloat. Uh, but so there, there is. It gets very specific into the facts in terms of the Paycheck Protection Act. But I would suggest for anybody, you know, you got to do, you got to look out for yourself. And if you're an employee, and you need to, you know, take care of yourself. Then, by all means, you should take advantage of these resources that are there. And it's, um, you know, same thing goes for for small business folks as well. So really, um, it's a, a really fact specific. But I would encourage folks to to um, to look hard at, at the the details. Okay, thank you. So on the Paycheck Protection Program, the whole idea behind that was keep your business alive. You might not be able to be open, but you keep your business alive. And you, so that means you pay your employees, you get enough money to pay your utilities, your rent, your mortgage interest, I believe it is. In other yes. words, your brick and mortar needs to be able to be there when you can open up again and your employees still need to be on the payroll. Is that correct? Yeah, so Julie, so let me give you an example. So let's say you were able to borrow $100,000 based on the formula that I talked about a minute ago. $100,000 just for the sake of argument. Now, uh, that money can be forgiven. You can spend up to 25% of that on costs not associated with payroll, which would include rent or mortgage, uh, interest on any existing debt, not any new debt, existing debt, and your utilities. So of that $100,000, $25,000 could be spent on those things. Now, this is we're talking about an eight-week period from the time when the loan closed till eight weeks. So this is the time frame. okay? Mm -hmm. So during that time frame, uh, under my scenario, $25,000 could be applied to rent, mortgage, utilities, uh, debt interest, okay? Assuming you had, you know, legitimate expenses that met that. 75% of it had to go to payroll costs. And that would be the things, you know, employee wages, but also benefit the costs of benefits and the gross uh, wages, uh, the gross payroll costs that, uh, you know, that you experience. So if you have, if you um, borrowed $100,000, and after the, that eight-week period, you had and able to document seventy-five thousand dollars in payroll costs and twenty-five thousand dollars in uh, utilities and rent and so forth. And then you can apply and get that whole amount forgiven, that whole one hundred thousand dollars forgiven. If you didn't quite have that much, let's say your rent costs were less and you only had fifteen thousand dollars, then you can apply to get um, a lower portion forgiven, and the rest would turn into a loan. 
And by the way, it turns into a very attractive loan. It's a 1% rate, I believe, uh, over two year time. So it's, it's still a really good deal. And the other thing I'd say is that there's no prepayment penalty. So let's say you decide, you know, hey, I'm going to borrow the $100,000. In the end, maybe you don't end up needing it all. Mm -hmm. And instead of having a note where you have to pay it back, you can just give it all back and you're not out any, any money. Uh, so whatever you're, you don't get forgiven, you just re repay without any penalty. So it really truly is a, you know, a, a great deal. Um, and just to follow Josh, up on that, because I know we've heard- Can I ask a question about that, Josh? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, one of the things that you're saying is that it's gonna be forgiven and everything, but is it gonna be counted as income no, as we go no, forward? That's a very not big- Not income, thing. that's another great thing. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's truly, <laughs> it's a good deal. It's almost too good to be true. And I know just from talking to, to Rep. Lenatra and Senator O'Connor, we've all heard from constituents who've had, had trouble just you know getting through to their banks, getting their applications in, because there has been a massive crush. And I know, you know the, the SP, the, so the federal government passes this new law, the SBA has to implement it, but it's the banks, our local banks, that are ones actually doing the loans. And so they had to wait for the SBA to issue guidance and directives, because this is you know brand new, uh, uncharted territory here. And so that guidance came, I think, last Thursday night, uh, and the next day the loan program was supposed to be open. But literally, I mean, we're, these are things that are happening like day by day, hour by hour. So I know from talking to some folks, some local banks, that you know they just weren't prepared, or not not for any fault of their own, they weren't ready for you know such a massive loan program in such a short amount of time without having the ability, you know, internally to to handle that. So some bigger banks are doing it. I know some smaller banks are doing it as well. I'm not going to name any bank names, but I know if you look around and talk to different banks, there are banks now on the South Shore that are doing these loans. Um, there's other banks that are, are not accepting applications unless you're a current um, customer, which I know is frustrating to some folks. And I've even, even heard of people who are current customers who are getting turned down. So it does pay to be a smart consumer here and to be a bit of a squeaky wheel and to really try to talk to your local bank and to, um, you know, to get that application in. And it, you can download the, the application form itself is very easy. It's two pages. Um, you'll need to to show your your payroll costs, your 941 forms, whatever else you have from your payroll you. company to document those costs. And so I would recommend you do all that legwork ahead of time. Do it now so that when you do get through to your bank and they are taking applications that you have everything you need and you just you know you give it to them right away. Great, thank you. And the whole idea of it being eight weeks is um, hopefully in eight weeks we will be in a position where businesses can open again. We don't know, but that I would think would be uh, part of the hope that's going on. A number of questions have come in um, since you've announced this. And one of them is, um, if someone started a business like late last year or they had just started one in January, they don't have a, a full year's worth or, or more of, <clears throat> of history, are they disqualified from applying from this loan or any of the assistance? Sure. Um, I don't mean to dominate this. I'm happy to, to grab that. Anybody else wants to jump in, please do. Um, so yeah, there is. There are a couple of provisions. Um, if you're a seasonal business or if you're a new business, if you're a seasonal business, then you, you average your co payroll cost over your seasonal time period. If you're a new business, you had to be in existence before uh, February 15th of 20, uh, 2020. And I believe um, if you look at the details of that, um, there's some specific information about what you should do if you're a new business. Because you can, in some cases, you're going to can still qualify even if you're a new business. Okay, um, this is this this came in a number of different ways. This question: I'm paid quote under the table. I have I've been paid some either some or all of my wages over the last year were paid not via a W two or ten ninety nine. Does that mean I don't have any record of payment? And can I put this toward the person who paid me? I don't know who wants to handle that one. <laughs> no one. <laughs> that's, I, that's, that's a tough one. Good luck. Um, I'm so, it, was, it wasn't clear to me, the, was it the employer or the employee? The employee, you're asking that the employee was saying that they don't have any record of, of well, they want to apply for unemployment, and if they've been paid under the table, so to speak, um, there's no record of them being paid legally, I guess. Who wants to... Right. Who wants to field yeah, that one? So I'm happy to have someone else take this. I think, unfortunately, sadly, if you have no documented wages, you know, W-2 that they're going to look to, then you're not going to be able to collect unemployment. Now, if, if you're getting paid, you know, as an independent contractor and filing a 1099, uh, then you will be eligible under this new pandemic uh, unemployment that's going to take effect at the end of the month. Uh, <laughs> but if you're getting paid and, and, and there's no documentation of that, obviously, there's no, that's the downside of that is that there's no proof of the income. And so therefore, there's no way that unemployment can, can be issued. 
Um, now, there are other forms of assistance, and certainly some of these things that we talked about would still be applicable to you. Like Patrick talked about the, uh, the, the, you know, the direct cash payments, that would still apply, uh, and some of the other things. But unfortunately, for unemployment now, you do have to have either W-2 income or, in this case, 1099 income. Okay. Uh, another question came in about, I, I'm still working, but my hours have been greatly reduced. Is there uh, assistance or help for me? <laughs> Josh, you're hogging so the So there's something called work share um, that an employer can do so that if they need to reduce their employees' hours and don't want to lay them off, they can keep them uh, employed in a part-time basis and still let the employee collect some portion of unemployment. So it's kind of a happy medium where you're not losing your employees, the employees still getting paid, but they're getting being made whole or you know not quite whole, hopefully close to it um, through unemployment. So that's called work share. Uh, the other thing I'd say is that if you have a reasonable fear of going to work and are not able to go to work, therefore, um, you are eligible now for unemployment uh, benefits, so you can apply. Can I ask another question, um, Josh, about unemployment with the six hundred? You, you have to ask it of someone else. <laughs> <laughs> Patrick, if the uh, six hundred dollars that is coming in for the um, additional um, from the CARE Act, um, that's being taxed just like unemployment is being taxed. I'm assuming. Uh, I believe so, yes. Okay, yeah. Because that's the thing the other two is people are like, I just talked to somebody who got their unemployment plus the $600 and they're like, look, we're, getting, we're making more money this month, this week than we were before. And I'm like, please put away money for taxes because you will have to pay them. So that's something that people have to realize that sometimes because of these benefits, we're, the government's trying to help you, but don't forget there's always something we have to pay at the end. Yeah, we started getting calls actually today because I think the $600 is hitting a lot of people's bank accounts today. And uh, we, we started getting calls, people not even knowing that they, you know, the federal government was giving this additional $600 to the state benefits. So there are some people that called us that, um, you know, were relieved that have a lot of bills that they have to pay. And, um, you know, they haven't been out of work for, you know, two, three, four weeks. So it's good that the federal government was able to do that. But you're absolutely correct that there is a a component that you know this is going to be taxed the same way that that ui is, is taxed right. that runs out july 31st too so okay. yeah it's up to four it's months it does okay yep okay and one of the things that i always do in my business i want to make sure that people understand what the whole overall situation is and that you know you've got a plan for the future and and make sure that you know if you think you have a little extra money just make sure you put that away so in case something else happens so Right. Okay. Um, thank you. Those those are all good. A um, couple questions from seniors. Um, I'm only I'm on Social Security. Am I going to get a check? And then another person who's a senior said, I also I take um, I have to take twenty five hundred dollars from my IRA. Do I still have to do that? Who wants to hit that one? That's I'll, the the first one's easy. Uh, yes. Yes. Yeah. Everyone everyone will get the 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 the. Uh, Twelve hundred dollars, or depending on their income, of course, uh, that's for everyone. So that that uh, applies regardless. Uh, the second part, I don't know the answer. I, we didn't uh, introduce Ted as also not just being a selectman, but the used to be the head of the Mass Society of CPAs. Maybe he has some insight there. <laughs> Put you on the spot. <laughs> Thank you. I haven't um, heard anything about um, not having to take your required distribution. Um, and I, I just, I haven't seen anything that would lead me to believe that you don't have to. Okay. Um, well, we, we had for a couple different forms that we've had, people have said that that is definitely now being floated out there. So maybe you can, you can check on that for, for the people yeah, in your su town. Suggest I suggest if, if whoever's asking that, please to, to let us know. And we'd be happy to, to, to contact Congressman Keating, our Congressman in here, who's been fantastic by the way, with, with everything. Um, and, and have his staff track that down and get some information about that. If you want to just have someone email any one of us, uh, I know you can put our emails up there, like your fancy titles, right? Um, we could. And we'd be happy to track that information. <laughs> yes, we do. We have fancy titles for all of you. Even um, in Zoom world, you have fancy titles, right? That's right. Um, the other exactly. question was um, on 401ks: Can we take a loan without the without the um, the reasons be before you had to take certain, there were certain reasons you could take a loan on a 401k. And if you have it and you take it and you can't pay it back, is there still the 10% penalty or is it just considered income? 
Ted might know that one. As far as I know, it's penalty. Okay. You know what, but, well, is there anything that anybody's heard about a hardship? Like sometimes on hardships, you can avoid that 10% penalty. But is this defined as a hardship with a pandemic emergency? Yeah, so I, I think that's a good question. You can withdraw from you can withdraw from our four hundred one k without without penalty due to COVID. You, you can. can okay. Can. You still have to pay the taxes though on the amount that was in the four hundred one k that you never pay taxes on. Right. It's still okay. it doesn't mean it's advisable, but you can do it. Okay. Yeah, you just don't get penalized an extra ten percent. Right. Okay. And what is the and is there a limit that anybody has heard that you can withdraw? I I don't know that. And and Josh, where did you where did you see that 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 you can take it That's, without the that was in the care, that was in the CARES Act. So it, so any so language about four hundred one k's is located in the CARES Act. Okay, That's correct. Good to know. And I know I, I, we have a, I have a very extensive Senator Markey sent us uh, like a twenty page frequently asked questions about the CARES Act that has um, because it's a massive bill. We haven't even talked about like there's student loan provisions benefits in there. Yeah. Um, there's a lot that's in there, and I know I have that on my website. I'm sure Senator O'Connor and Rep. Lenatra could share that with folks as well. But there is a pretty lengthy frequently asked questions um, that I'm sure I, I actually did some research on the student loans if you want me to talk about it for one second. Yes, please do. <laughs> sure. um, the student loans, if it's a federal student loan, then it's already been um, deferred and there's no interest all the way up till September 30th of this year. Um, so that definitely is going to help. And this is through the CARE Act. Um, you can continue paying if you want to. Um, but all the payments go right to your principal, which is helpful too. Um, you basically, um, the rate, if you've got a private loan, you've got to contact your servicer because it's not under the CARES Act. It's, it's more federal um, student loans. Um, matter of fact, my daughter who has one was going to pay her payment. And they said, you don't, you know, you could basically have a, a payment holiday right now going on this. Um, so, I mean, I think that's definitely a good thing for people. And there's no penalties and there's no accruing interest. So um, at least, you know, the younger people who maybe have lost a job, it's helping them a little bit too. I can, can I, I can amplify one thing too that's great about that. That's great, by the way, because I'm someone who has a student loan still. I'm still paying my law school loan, believe it or not. <laughs> um, but there's also another benefit in the CARES Act that has a provision um, that an employer can contribute up to $5,200 annually towards an employee's student loans um, on a tax-free basis. So uh, that would require your employee employer willing to do that. But if you have a, a friendly employer who's willing to do that or maybe work something out, that's a great benefit as well, $5,200 on a tax-free basis to, to help pay your student loans. So. And the employer does, basically can write that off. Is that what you're yeah, saying? Right. So it's a good deal for, for everybody. Great. Another question that came in from um, employers, if we can stay open, but some of our employees can't come in for legitimate reasons, one reason or another, um, can I use their accrued vacation and sick time to pay them? Can you or do you have? Uh, certainly I think either. They can. Either. Yeah. The so this, this gets into FRICA, the Families First Corona Response Act that the Rep. Lenatra was talking about. Th that has paid leave provisions. Um, that that uh, an employee employee can take to uh, care for themselves or a family member. And I forget the exact number of weeks it's on. It's it's available here to be paid. So an employee would not have to use up could use that before using up their own um, personal time or or sick time. Uh, that was and that's something that the employee has a, has a right to do. So the Families First Corona Response Act has the. Uh, Emergency paid sick leave provision. So, if folks, I want to look into that. They, they should they should do so. And then again, that's a benefit to the employer as well, because the federal government uh, cover picks that up cost up through a tax uh, re refund, essentially. Okay, so um, Rep. 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 Rep Len Lenatra, can you just um, answer this question? What is a qualifying reason for someone to be eligible for that Families First Corona Response Act? So there's six reasons that are listed, and one is if um, you have to be quarantined as a federal, state, or local mandate, uh, if you're caring for someone that has coronavirus, if you yourself um, are susceptible of getting it, um, you have your, your child, if you have a child that you need to take care of because the schools are closed during this, and you do not budget for childcare, you do not have childcare, you need to take care of them. 
uh, again, if your immune system is suppressed and you just can't be around that, those are one of the, those are some of the reasons. Okay. I think from, can I speak to families first for one second too? Please do. Um, there is a major gray area and I brought this up and I know that Rep. Lenatra and Rep. Cutler has too, to our federal delegation that the Families First Act, it was established and it started on the 2nd of April. So there is still a gray area there for individuals who were stricken with COVID-19, who were quarantined due to travel or contact with COVID-19, or um, just generally taking care of a family member from when we started our state of emergency until April 2nd. So we are still trying to work out the logistics of that because we've actually had a situation where we have two members of the healthcare community, one at South Shore Hospital, one at the Brockton VA. One of them, they're both married together. One of them contracted COVID-19, uh, helping the population and was quarantined with his wife and they came back to depleted sick, sick time because they got sick prior to April 2nd. So there is some things that we still have to work out inside of this federal legislation. And some of the things that people talk about where we may not have an answer to yet, there just may have, there, a solution might just not be on the table or hasn't officially come into uh, pass either by the federal or state yet. But we're hearing everything and we're working, uh, as Josh and Kathy said, literally on a minute by minute, hour by hour basis, trying to address the needs that pop up in some of these really tricky gray areas because there is no playbook to handle employment and small business when it comes to, you know, basically a almost complete shutdown of our, of our Commonwealth. <clears throat> right. It, it, and that's when I said right in the beginning um, of this forum, a lot of the questions are so individualized because everyone has their own completely unique set of circumstances. And it's, it's, it's really hard, um, Senator, to your point, to you, you can't have a playbook that covers everybody and everybody's a little bit different. I assume that um, the two representatives here are probably getting an awful lot of individual calls from people saying, what do I do? Here's my situation. How do you both handle that? Josh, we'll go to you first, then to Kathy. Sure. Well, that's that's when I'm not doing Zooms. That's what I'm doing. <laughs> but yeah, but honestly, no. I, I mean, people should not be shy about reaching out to any one of us. That's why we're here. You know, we want to help you, and so uh, and we do. We'll do whatever we can to try to get you the information. So you know, I, I know that I, I can speak for my colleagues when I say that as well. I'm sure. I've got a little more information on that required minimum distribution. Okay. Ah. Ventures. Um, there is a, um, for plans up to a hundred thousand dollars can be taken, uh, from the plan with not, without having the early 10% withdrawal penalty <laughs> wouldn't apply. And it would be taxed over a three year period rather than one year. In addition, the act allows a suspension of the required minimum distribution in the year 2020 for various retirement plans, IRAs, 4013As, 403Bs, and certain 457B plans. Uh, therefore, the penalties associated with not taking the required minimum distribution would be suspended. Okay. All right. Do they IRAs too? Uh, yes. Yeah. Yes. It's 401Ks and IRAs, I believe. Yeah. 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 So, so in other words, if you have to, it's never recommended, but if you have to take a loan against your 401k, if I'm hearing you correctly, you can take up to $100,000. Uh, of mm -hmm. course, you'd have to be vested in it. Um, and it's not, you don't get the 10% penalty that you would have gotten for taking it early, but, Do not. but it won't be taxed in one year. It'll be taxed over three years, which would be a huge help. Do, did I hear yeah. you correctly? Well, it's not a but it's not a loan, it's a withdrawal. You said right. the word loan. It's yeah, I'm sorry, right. yes, you're right, it's a withdrawal. Right, okay. Well, that, that's that's a good uh, a safety net for some some families that might need that. Of course, that would be a last resort, but it, it's something that's, that's there. Is there right. a place, now, Josh, you just said that you and Kathy both spend an awful lot of time hearing from constituents saying, here's my situation, help me. Is there a, a one one place that people can call or go to that is set up to hear their situation and then advise them exactly what they should do. Okay. Um, you talk about each of our individual contact information or? No, 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 just just for the public in general. There's a million different websites. Oh, this, oh, you know what I mean? Oh, right, is there, right. is there, yeah, is there one you. stop <laughs> shopping where you could call someone and they'll be able to help you completely soup to nuts? Uh, well, maybe not quite that extensive, but I, I, I would always suggest people go to mass.gov slash COVID. 
Um, that is the state of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts like, website. And if you follow the links there, you can pretty much get to anywhere you need to go. I would just use this opportunity to, to, to mention one thing we didn't mention before, which is that they, um, the Department of Unemployment Assistance has a, a daily a virtual town hall, kind of like what we're doing right now. Uh, but they offer for folks uh, just focused on unemployment and they have experts there who walk you through steps and can answer your questions about unemployment. Um, and that's something you can sign up for the night before. Um, and it's on their website, DUA Virtual Town Hall. If you Google that, I'm sure uh, you can find it on the interwebs. Um, but I, you know, I suggest that. And then for all of us, you know, we all have our staffs. And this, I give a shout out to to my staff. And I know Rep. Lenatras and Senator O'Connor staff are working hard too. We're all working remotely. They're not at the state house now. They're working from homes or from wherever, and uh, working hard and uh, trying to you know do everything they can to help us to help help all of you. Um, but I know, um, you know, best way to get to me is either a phone call or frankly, email is even the best way just because I kept checking my emails 24 seven. I'm sure it's no different for Kat, Kathy and Pat. So um, that's probably the best way. Um, and it's about taxes. Now, um, the people do not have to file their federal taxes or state, I believe, until correct. until the July, 15th of July. July. Is that correct? July 15th. Okay. July 15th. Okay. July. But people should still be keeping track of everything that they're doing this year in any financial way because they're going to have to somehow report whatever is done next year on their taxes. Is that correct? Yeah, it, it, you know, yeah, just like normal. The only difference is that this year, instead of the tax deadline being you know, in April, it's, it's, it's July 15th, and that's for the state and for federal taxes. And I think it's important to note, too, that uh, Massachusetts previously uh, delayed some business taxes like um, uh, restaurant meals taxes and other types of sales taxes were delayed uh, as well to help out our, our small businesses. So, you know, we've been trying to, to push that uh, whenever possible to mm -hmm. um, give people a little bit of a, you know, flexibility there. But yeah, you should normally, you should, you know, do the things that you do normally, talk to your accountant uh, and, and make sure you document everything. And, and for uh, our, our municipalities, for our, our partners at the town level, we want to make sure that, and they all know this, but to, to document all the expenses as well, because this is a federal disaster, much like if a big hurricane came through. And we're hopeful that when this is all done, we can, um, you know, through FEMA, apply to have some of these extraordinary costs reimbursed by the federal, the federal government. Okay, excellent. I had one other question that came in um, yesterday, and it, it was, uh, someone was in the midst of a job search. Um, they were currently unemployed. They were actually a finalist, and then this happened. And so they weren't employed. Do they still um, qualify for unemployment? So there is uh, there is an extension for people who exhausted their previous benefits. So if someone was previously on unemployment and their benefits ran out, um, so that may be that that might be applicable in that scenario. Then that individual would be eligible for up to 13 weeks of additional benefits. Mm -hmm. um, that is not in effect yet. That is another one of the federal benefits, and we're waiting for that to be implemented. Mm -hmm. uh, I suspect that'll be implemented pretty soon. But so that would be something in that scenario that might help that person. I think this person was actually, the way I read it, I don't think they were on unemployment. I think they were, they had probably been between jobs. They were looking for a job and they, they were, they were about to get a job. And because of this, now they can't get the job. So are well, they so if qualified? They, if they were, if they were un, if they're unemployed now, yep. as long as they, within the time frame, then they would be eligible. It really would have to get specific into the, when they last held the job, but they might still be eligible. So they should, they should pursue that uh, at the mass.gov. Okay. Those were all the questions I had that came in. Will all of you that have heard each other, has something else come to mind or something else you want to bring up before we close this out? Why don't we start with um, Senator? No, just to reiterate what the representative said and what Ted said, if there's any help, and Ann, if there's any help that we can give you at all during this period of time, don't hesitate to reach out. If you could put my contact information down there, it's, it's my name at masenate.gov is the email address, and 617-722-1646 is our uh, as our number up at the state house, we're trying to work through um, as many um, constituent concerns as possible, and they range primarily in unemployment, small business assistance, uh, helping to uh, secure PPE for our first responders in our hospitals. Uh, there's a there's a lot of work going on right now um, in all of our offices, and I really, really want to thank and credit the local leadership, Ted, all of you for really putting in place you know great guidance and great guidelines for the residents of Duxbury and UC. The, the actions that we've taken and the local leadership really working in, um, in doing exactly what we intended with social distancing. And so I just couldn't be prouder of the team that the Commonwealth and the South Shore really has right now 
working together hand in hand to, to address so many issues. Thank you, Senator. Um, that was Senator Patrick O'Connor. And um, Ted Flynn, Duxbury Selectman, any last words you want to depart? No, I, I just want to reiterate that town government is working and we're working 24 seven in a different sort of frame, virtually in a lot of ways, rather than live. But we're here and look forward to this scourge ending and our ability to get back to life as normal. Thank you. That was uh, Duxbury Selectman Ted Flynn. Um, Ann Antonellis, Duxbury Business Association and Realtor. Final closing Actually, words from you? Broker. But uh, thank Sorry, you broker. very much. Um, I, the Josh, Kathy, and Patrick, you've been doing an unbelievable job for letting us know what's going on. Um, it is such an unnerving time, surreal. Um, if you need our help at all with the GBA, just let me know and I'll get messages out as much as I can. Um, and um, thank you, Ted, too, for everybody thing that you, the town's doing because the town has been very supportive. And I mean, I think we just need to all be self, socially distancing and try to stay as safe as possible. Excellent. We thank will get you. through all this. We will go get through all this. Thank you, Anne. And uh, Representative uh, Kathy Lenatra, last words? Yes, I just wanted to mention the 211 number as well. If you need some information, you can call 211. Um, and there's some information there. You can ask questions as well. But thank you to my colleagues. Thank you to Rep Cutler for putting this together. This has been wonderful. Um, all the towns in my district have been working very well together. The social distancing is going well. And again, please feel free to reach out to myself and my legislative aide. His name is Christopher Jean. And my email is kathleen.lenatra at mahouse.gov. That is probably the best way to reach me. As um, Brett Cutler said, we are on our laptops or our computers 24 seven from the minute we get up to the minute we go back, uh, trying to answer each question as quickly as we can. I will say you need a little patience here. We're getting to them as quickly as we can. Um, but thank you again. And thank you, Julie, the second time I've seen you today. So I appreciate it. <laughs> Thank you. And before we go um, to you, Josh, to close out, I just want to say that how impressed as, as the executive director of PAC TV, and we have four towns, we have Plymouth and Duxbury and Kingston and uh, Pembroke that we, that we represent and we serve. I am absolutely astounded by the level of competency, and I shouldn't be astounded, but I'm, I'm uh, the incredible energy, the patience, the kindness, the um, just the humanity that our town officials overall are showing, not only towards each other, but towards every nonprofit, every group, every business, the, the kids that are home, the parents that are home with the kids. It is so wonderful to see this kind of brotherhood and togetherness during this really difficult time. And to witness it firsthand, I am honored. We are so proud at PAC TV to be able to help bring all this wonderful news and information to people to keep them informed and keep them informed by people who, who really are the ones who know what they're talking about. Because there's a lot of misinformation out there and it's nice to hear from the, rep the representatives that are either elected or, or, um, or work for the towns and, and every single day are doing their best to keep the towns running. So I just want to thank everybody for that. And now that I'm done with my, soap, my soapbox, um, Josh, would you like to have any final words? Sure, I don't think I can say it any better than you guys have. Uh, well, just, just again, thank you everyone for, for joining us. Uh, I think just in terms of community access television, we should all remember when this is all over, how important that PAC TV and you know similar uh, local community access stations have been during this. We wouldn't be able to have these kinds of forums. We wouldn't be able to have our selectmen's meetings in many cases and other local government without them. So hopefully we'll remember that. Um, mm -hmm. I want to thank everyone for tuning in. Uh, thank my great colleagues. It's, it's great. One of the nice things, and, and, and you mentioned that, Julie, is you know, the spirit of bipartisanship and cooperation. And you know, maybe we don't see it always in Washington, but we see it here in, in Massachusetts. And we see it at the local level in our cities and towns. And I too have been very impressed by the folks in Duxbury and Pembroke and Hanson. And I'm sure all of you and your communities, uh, what, what a wonderful job everyone's done to kind of come together because we really are all, all in this together. So thanks for tuning in. We'll be happy to do this again. Maybe we can do a deep dive on some of these issues that folks have raised. And uh, please feel free to reach out. My email address is uh, josh.cutler at mahouse. Gov. Thanks for tuning in. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you so Thank much. You. And to see this again, 
um, you will you just go to our website, pactv.org slash Duxbury. We're also going to replay this on our community channel uh, someplace in the near future and just check out pactv.org um, to get the uh, replay schedule because everybody should see this. And Josh, I think that's a really good idea. Maybe a week or two from now we'll have another one of these because you'll notice we date stamped the day that we uh, recorded this. Because things change so quickly, it's really important to get the most up-to-date information. And this might change, and there might be other things available next week or the week after. So we look forward to seeing you. We, uh, From all of us at PAC TV, we hope you stay safe, social distance, and we will get through this together. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye.